delighted to welcome you to our webinar today. Our subject, Small States and Great Power Relations, is one which is often brought to mind, even more so than a small, highly developing state who attempt to navigate and secure their interest in a world dominated by far larger states. These tiny gems, the sits of the world, are scattered along the Caribbean Sea, the Pacific, the Indian, and the Atlantic Oceans. Microstates like these have very little source of influence on the world stage. They have no armies. They have little by way of leverage. They are often the playground of the rich and the famous. Their economies, usually based on one sector, are open and enormously vulnerable to exogenous shocks. They too have interests which must be secured, defended, and protected. How is this to be done? History gives us some clues. On July 26, 1956, a mere three years after independence, Egyptian President Nasser took the bold decision to nationalize the Suez Canal a valuable waterway through which two thirds of the world's oil passed, and in so doing, wrest control from the British. Egypt was a member of the so-called Third World, a group of the world's poor and developing countries. Though Egypt lost the war, led by Israel, joined by France and the British, they nonetheless won control of the vital waterway. How so? Because of powerful friends and their interest. The two superpowers of the day, the Soviets and the, and the United States, were engaged in the Cold War. The Soviets were on the brink of engagement on the side of Egypt. The US was looking to diminish, not increase, the Soviet sphere of influence. And Egypt, and quite a bit of Africa and elsewhere, were already flirting with the Soviets. A wider war was simply not in their interest. The Suez Canal was returned to Egypt. In the world of global politics, friends matter, interests matter, the geopolitics of the day also matter. The US-Soviet Cold War is no more, but these are extraordinary and uncertain times. Great power rivalry and competition between the United States and China are at an all-time high. Economic and political power is tilting from west to east, and some believe that we are on the brink of another Cold War, this time, with the digital era as the new frontier. The world is still in the grips of an ongoing pandemic and the post COVID-19 recovery will be a long drawn out process. In this era of heightened tensions, all small states, even more so micro states such as the Sids of the Caribbean need to tread warily. They can ill afford to be caught in the conflict between East and West. In such a world, how do they influence global policies and secure their interest? Can they? Where do they fail? What can they do better? Do shifts in global power provide a wider menu of choice or must they pick a side? To put the scale of the issue in context, consider the following. The 24 countries of the insular Caribbean attack, account for approximately 44 million people. The big three, Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic hold 75% of the population with more than 10 million persons each. The nine tiny English speaking islands of the Eastern Caribbean account for less than 600,000 people, about half of the population of Port of Spain, Trinidad. Small size is therefore also relative. With the exception of Haiti, these middle income countries, which are systemic due to their size and economic structure, and also environmental due to their location in the tropics and the ever-present threat of tropical cyclones. The United Nations names them as among the world's most vulnerable of all countries. They face a number of challenges in pursuit of their development. Small size provides few options of scale. Some have been in fact villainized as being tax havens. Oddly, the largest such centers in the Caribbean are former colonies or colonies of the OECD countries. Neither rich enough nor poor enough, Caribbean SIDS oftentimes fall through the cracks. They inhabit a space which I call the myth of paradise. Seductive images, beaches, sunsets, rum punch, the chill back vibe of the Caribbean, romance of the Caribbean are real and legendary. But behind this reality is another. High levels of unemployment, especially for youth, are the norm. 
the region provides a conduit for drugs from South America to North America and to Europe. The Caribbean is home, however, to real people with real lives trying to make ends meet. What the region wants is not a handout, but fair treatment in the policies which affect them, and perhaps too, a voice in their articulation and their design. Joining me today to expound in the fascinating arena of small states in the world of diplomacy and great power rivalry and competition are my colleagues and friends. Escipion Olivier Gomez, Assistant Secretary General of ACP, Paula Bowens, an international consultant and former diplomat, and Eustace Wallace, Counselor for the High Commission of St. Kitts and Nevis in Ottawa. During my tenure as an ambassador in Brussels, Paula, Eustace, and I were colleagues in the same embassy. I referred to them as my Team A. We experienced firsthand the challenges of being small in a big world, but small, we know, is also an opportunity to do things not only differently, but also better. It is a special joy, my friends, to welcome all three of you to this discussion. I realize that uh, my video is posing a bit of a challenge this morning, but hopefully we can get through it. Let's get right to it. Let's start off by examining the elements of the toolkit of soft power at the disposal of the Caribbean and how these are deployed. Eustace, let's start with you. What do you consider to be the Caribbean soft power? How does the Caribbean deploy soft power in the exercise of its own interest? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ishmael. Thank you for the invitation to be among such esteemed colleagues. I, this is a mini reunion, as you said, so I'm grateful for the opportunity. Digging right into it, as you said, global geopolitical politics has increased in the last couple of years. The pandemic that we're in right now brings it into sharper focus. And in the area of soft power, we see that in the rollout of vaccines. We're now using a term vaccine diplomacy. The conversations this week alone, from Cornwall to Brussels to Geneva, all clear projections of soft power unveiled in sharp terms the geopolitical lines that are being drawn among the great powers. Amid this rumbling of global tectonic change, as you said, Caribbean islands find themselves in a precarious position, and we have to devise strategies to be a part of the conversation. The current position of the Caribbean reminds me of a story I read not too long ago. During the Cold War between the Soviets and the US, Burkina Faso, which was then Upper Volta, found itself stuck literally at the UN between the Soviets and the United States. This has long been the posture of the Caribbean. But I think one thing that we have learned over time as small island states is this. You either become submissive and trampled, or you become agile, creative, ambitious, and imaginative. And that word imaginative, therein lies our strength, because our culture is our arsenal in our tool in terms of influencing our diplomatic engagements. And so what we have to do is keep pounding the story. And I was reminded recently by Agnes Poirier, who wrote the book Left Bank, that across the capitals of Europe during the last Cold War, culture was the main battlefield for influence. And so as small island states, we have to ensure that we play on that battlefield as well. Through culture, we're able to topple barriers, start conversations, find commonalities, cultivate partnerships, and of course, expand networks. And this will become even more necessary in this new environment. To quote Joshua Jelly Shapiro, an author I recently read who wrote the book, Island People, he said, islands are potent places. And for 500 years, this exemplary sea of islands in the imagination has proved irresistible to adventurers, poets, protesters, and hedonists alike. As the place where globalization began, and the region too, where the ongoing conversation about universal human rights began, the Caribbean has been anything but marginal.
the making of the modern world. We need to keep pounding this story every chance we get. We already do that on the streets of Toronto during Caribana, in Notting Hill Carnival, on the park or in Brooklyn every year. What we need to do now is weave that into the full frontal display of our diplomacy in capitals we know and those we don't. And of course, we've long hailed the legacies of Nepal and Walcott. We have now the likes of Rihanna and Usain Bolt to amplify those messages into the consciousness of potential partners. The melting pot of peoples we embrace in the Caribbean as a result of our history gives us enormous reach across the world. And we need to leverage that in rebelling against the idea that small is insignificant or peripheral. So culture is our main tool and we should never hesitate to use it. Okay, uh, Eustace, thank you so very much. Uh, just a little note from our producers. You might have YouTube on and is causing sound interference in the studio if that's the case. No, okay, all right. Um, they're hearing uh, actually your voice uh, twice, but whilst they try to sort this out, let me move right on to Paula. Paula, um, Caribbean people are scattered around the world. They are also concentrated in some of the seats of world power in London, New York, Toronto, as you just said, and elsewhere. Their numbers are significant. Quite often we see national governments calling on these communities to play a very significant role back home in national elections. But there seems to be far less appreciation of the vital role which they can and should be playing as a political for force to influence policy in the very centers where they live today. Is there a wider role for the region's diaspora in the execution of its soft power? Thank you very much, Dr. Ishmael, and I thank you. All protocols being observed, I will delve right into the matter. A world bank living abroad, to every person still resident within the Caribbean. In fact, some countries like St. Lucia have a migration rate of 50%, 20% being considered as unsustainable. Studies indicate that the diaspora from the Caribbean region is both highly educated and highly engaged. So how can the Caribbean use its diaspora to parlay its influence globally? Beyond the traditional role of the diaspora, which is philanthropy, tourism, remittances, etc. There is another role that the Caribbean diaspora is playing and should be harnessed for targeted impact in the global arena. They are the living face of the Caribbean in the outside world and they contribute as Eustace said linked to the Caribbean that is seen in the various cities that they live. They are the promoters, promoters of Caribbean culture, clothing, music, and they bring that along with them in North America, Canada, as you said, the UK and wider Europe. For example, you have a number of famous names of Caribbean people who have contributed to changing the world of music, economics, literature, politics, and whose presence in foreign countries have brought attention to the islands and they have power to influence global discourse. For example, Sir Arthur Lewis, economics Nobel laureate, a pioneer of development economics. He received that honor while he was a professor at the University of Princeton. I can also name Debbie Ransom of Trinidadian Heritage, head of BBC Caribbean News Service for over 10 years. She herself contributing to breaking the sea seemingly hegemonization of the consumed out there. So the Caribbean diasporic creativity is an essential tool in redressing the imbalances of Caribbean's presence on the global stage. Now, of course, more needs to be done by the Caribbean from a political perspective to marshal the force of the diaspora in favor of positive, what I call positive positioning. For example, India has been able to harness the economic strength of its diaspora to use it to enhance their economic performance and their human development indices. In practice, the Caribbean is trying such, for example, 
countries such as St. Kitts and Nevis, Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, they have embarked on the project of using the diasporic ties strategically. Now, the diaspora can work towards the promotion of Caribbean interests wherever they are. I will take the example of the Caribbean Chamber of Commerce in Europe, for example, which seeks to facilitate trade and commerce between and Europe. Now, what it does is that it positions itself as a bilateral and multilateral tool managed by the Caribbean diaspora, offering services to Caribbean businesses seeking to penetrate the EU market in a safe and trusted manner. We have other examples. Let's look at the French Caribbean, Christiane Tobiha, who's from French Guyana. She became a French Minister of Justice, and she worked on reforming the criminal justice system in France and how it's perceived in the, in the Caribbean. Or the case of the Surinamese, Surinamese words that are brought by the diaspora into the Dutch urban language and culture. Or even the world-renowned Jackie Compton from St. Lucia, who's a celebrity chef operating out of New York. So it is organized Caribbean diaspora affordable tool of modern representation of the Caribbean Thank you, Paula. Um, I lost you a little bit uh, there at the end, and um, I think maybe our challenges might be the fact that we are located on different continents at, at the moment, all of us. But anyway, let's let's press on, and hopefully uh, everything improves. Uh, Espion, Escipion, um, goods and services, and sometimes even the flora and fauna of uh, produced by a region or country seem to symbolize also aspects of its soft power. Pizzas remind us of Italy, cheeses and wine of France. Panda reminds us of China's cultural diplomacy. What role do Caribbean exports play in the exercise of its soft power, would you say? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishmael. For me, it's a big honor to be here today with all of you, with my Caribbean brothers and sisters. Um, our islands ha are, well, in general, small in size, with a, but with a humongous heart. Economically, it's very difficult to attain a competitiveness if you only concentrate in, in your small market. Hence, we have to export in order to attain the quality and normal economies of scale to be able to compete in our own markets, where naturally, we are exporters and we have been since the time of the Arawaks because the Arawaks did trade a lot among each other. We, they came from Belize all the way down to Guyana, passing through all of our islands. So exports of goods and services is really a very important tool for us. However, the times are changed before we, we used to export very big quantities, at, at least regarding to our size at a cheap price. These are things that we can no longer afford. We really have, our, our sheer size do not allow us really to attain competitiveness by trying to compete on quantities or prices unless that we're looking to sell uh, poverty. This type of vision of trade, at least for our small countries, is not really efficient nor sustainable. So the, the quest that we're embarking is trying to differentiate ourselves in the market. Uh, most people are ready to pay a prime for good products. And the Caribbean is seen by most people, especially in Europe, especially in winter, as paradise on earth. And we have to bottle that paradise. Uh, Eustace and Paula have explained a lot how our people have taken the flag of our countries to the highest levels. I, 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 for me, well, we have the fastest, man, the fastest man on earth. We have, uh, St. Lucia has by a uh, proportion of uh, people per square kilometer, has the highest number of uh, Nobel prizes and Grenada by the same measure has really the highest number of gold medals in the Olympics with Karani James. So. We have really to promote this. We, we have, when we sell, when we sell ourselves, when we sell our culture, we do have to 
sell our history with it, our heritage. People shouldn't buy rum because uh, it's just rum. No, rum has a history. It has a history. It was born in the Caribbean for the Caribbean. And even for, for us in Dominican Republic, if you haven't noticed, I'm not English speaking. Uh, even drinking rum has, uh, I would say, some kind of protocol. Uh, in my country, the first thing after we open a bottle is to throw a little bit on the floor to remember our ancestors, to give some to our ancestors that they will be drinking with us. So that part of us must be in everything we do and in everything we sell. Uh, I, I do believe that Caribbean people and people like me shouldn't be ashamed of their accents. We should wear our clothing. We should wear our jewelry. Uh, we have really excellent handicraft people. And a, a really a role is really to do that. However, in a competitiveness basis, it's not only trying to sell your culture and that will sell the product. We do have to understand the markets that we're targeting. We have to do some market research and understand how better we have to market our own culture. And I was just talking about, for me, we have to market our culture and identity into everything we sell, products and services. Because in a lot of our culture, services are for free and nobody should pay. You shouldn't pay anybody to help you. And consultancy basis is not really well paid in our countries. But we do have to appreciate that we do have good people. And in most of the world, people do pay for advice. So I do believe that is packaging, what we do, what we sell, and offering as a premium product, Caribbean goods and services are premium. I can mention some, I think, well, uh, for those that uh, like coffee, definitely the Blue Mountain coffee is extraordinary. Almost as good as the Dominican one, but better known. <laughs> well, I, I have to recognize that Blue Mountain coffee is really maybe one of the best in the world. And it's sold at $10 a cup in, in, um, in, in Japan. However, you have to market it as a $10 a cup coffee. A $10 a cup coffee comes in a very nice package, explained very well, the quality has to be top and everything. Uh, when we work in fashion as well, well, a very good fashion designer of the world was Caribbean, was a, uh, uh, <laughs> from my own country, Oscar uh, de la Renta. Right. Yeah, he sold quality. He sold Dominican, Caribbean, but quality. So it has to it, it has to add up. And given that we were talking about very influential people, I wanted to mention that for me, uh, Sidney Poitier, that is really from the region because his parents were from the Bahamas, really was a pioneer opening really uh, the uh, Hollywood to our people with a film like Guess who's coming to dinner for me at a very young age? It really impacted me. And knowing that Sidney Poitier had his origins in the Caribbean is something that is, for me, something that I cherish. So uh, having said that, yes, we have to use our culture, our heritage, uh, and the beauty of our landscape to sell and to be competitive. Sorry for being so long. Uh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, we will need to move on a little bit faster because uh, I'm a little bit surprised to see almost one third of the way through our time. And let's move quickly on to the, the reality that uh, the cities of the world are small. Uh, we have just had a little bit of a discussion with respect of how we utilize our soft power in the exercise of uh, the interest of, 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 of SIDS. Uh, not only Caribbean SIDS, but SIDS around the world. But there are other formal means by which SIDS all over the world try to leverage their own presence to be able to pursue their interests. Uh, Eustace, why don't you take us through some of those more formal mechanisms? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Of course, the United Nations represents the main institution for us as small island states to gain a foothold in global politics. I hear myself repeating and I still don't understand why there's a, there's a feedback. I can't explain it from my end. But what I will say, the United Nations represent the core part of our global strategy. And I know that when we think of the UN, the term itself 
conjures up image of everyone sitting around on a beach, drinking rum, listening to bachata or souk or calypso. But in reality, the UN is a forum of cliques. And this isn't a criticism at all. It is human nature to form coalitions with like-minded countries and peoples to advance common interests. It is therefore natural that Caribbean SID would seek out uh, such coalitions. The alliance of small island states represent one of our signature coalition building um, groupings in the international arena. So too the G77, which started with 77 states, but now has a membership of 134. These groupings represent the global South. They operate more potently across the United Nations General Assembly, more democratically than the United Nations Security Council, where we don't have a voice. And so these alliances help us to push our agenda forward. EOSIS, for example, was established to ensure that islands from the Caribbean to the Indian Ocean to the Pacific presented a united front in international climate negotiations. Our, vulnerab our vulnerabilities unite us and our solidarity allows us to punch above our weight in these intense negotiations. 39 voices acting as one allow the term SIDS to become part of the development paradigm. 39 voices acting as one allow the UNFCCC to raise climate ambitions. 39 voices acting as one allow the Paris Agreement to become a reality. And 39 voices acting as one this year will ensure that we get much more out of Glasgow than we normally would have. And so I am often reminded by the ambassador of Fiji, who likes to say that for small island developing states, you can go from high income to middle income to no income in the span of three days. And I think AOSIS allows us to get that message out there in a way where if St. Kitts and Nevis were on its own, it would never be able to do so. Similarly, the G7, G77, which, which, which was created in the 1960s to try and bring the global south along in trade and economic development, that allowed us to push forward to have stuff like the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so these sort of institutional groupings and coalitions is a necessary component of our coalition building as small island developing states. If the G77 did not exist, we would have to create it. If AOSIS did not exist, we'd have to create it. And so these things also allowed one of our very own, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, to become a member of the United Nations Security Council. And that is a very big deal in itself. Thank you, Eustace. And speaking about coalitions, you're so very right. I mean, alliances are the bedrock of how SIDS are able to pursue and defend their own interests, eloquently put. Now, uh, Isipion, you sit at the very heart of one of the world's pioneering South South models of South South cooperation as ASG in the African, Caribbean, Pacific group of countries. Uh, how do you see the SIDS, our SIDS, the SIDS of our world, uh, benefiting from this particular coalition? Uh, Eustace, Paula, and I remember that it was our embassy uh, that pushed uh, uh, for the development of a SIDS forum uh, at the ACP and wrote that very first proposal to actually establish uh, this institutional mechanism. What's the benefit for SIDS? Thanks, Dr. Ismail. Ismail. Uh, yes, SIDS are a very active group within the OECPS. Um, we really include um, countries in the SIDS from all regions, from Africa, from the Caribbean and the Pacific, and we have similar problems. And to the seeds, we have to also add some landlocked countries, countries such as Swaziland, 
Eswatini, and Lesotho, which in a way or another could also be considered islands within a continent. And it, the SIDS worked very actively within the forum, mainly led by the OECS, Barbados, and Samoa, Fiji as well, which have taken a leading role all over. Uh, they speak very actively in the United Nations, among others, to defend, uh, how would I say, uh, a special and differential treatment in trade for our countries. Uh, you were very eloquent when you expressed that uh, we were graduated from development aid, but the meaning that they told us basically is that we graduated from poverty. And those people that don't think that we have graduated from poverty have not visited our countries really well. Uh, and insularity and smallness, while it's nice, it also has its challenges. A hospital for 5,000 people costs the same as a hospital for a million persons. A airport for two flights a day or a week costs the same as an airport that will receive 20, 30 flights a day. So there is a cost. There is a cost. And in a way or another, I do believe that a lot of our seeds, especially those in the Caribbean, are nowadays paying for really supporting social development a lot. So uh, we have to continue to work in this alliance. Alliance has been good, but has to go to other levels. And we have to continue to believe in ourselves. I am sad to note that even if we have great examples of great leaders, often our people believe in foreigners from the North than in our people from the South. But yes, the Alliance is good. The OECPS is behind it. And we really hope to strengthen through actions like this one. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I'd like to shift gears a little bit um, as we continue to set, because all we've been doing so far is setting the state for what the reality is for SIDS, especially those from the Caribbean. We know that historically the Caribbean played a very important role in early world trade and the colonies were very rich. One remembers that the aspirations of the Dutch um, the Dutch colonizers of Manhattan, for example, was to attain the prosperity of the Jamaican planter class. And that was in bygone days. Well, what are some of the issues which the Caribbean grapples with today, which are linked to its early history? Because I know that some of that early history resonates still today. Paula, what are your views? Thank you. Thank you. You are right. In fact, the Caribbean has always been a strategically important region, both for Europe, for the US today, and most recently for up and coming global powers. As you said, historically, the region was a place for the expansion of Europe. You had a very heavy colonial presence in the Caribbean, and these islands represented trophies of domination and economic supremacy for major European powers, such as, as you said, Portugal, France, Denmark, Netherlands, Spain, and of course, Great Britain. And they got that through piracy, through slavery, and later on military bases to fight, for example, the American Revolutionary Wars. Now, during the long period of colonization, the island's economies evolved from one of subsistence for the settlers to, to lucrative economic powerhouses, as you, you said earlier on. For example, sugar production helped to finance the Industrial Revolution in England but the cost was the enslavement of Africans. Now, following the abolition of slavery, the island's populations also went through for the shifts in composition through the indentureship of laborers from India and China. And also throughout the 20th century, the, the Caribbean also attracted Syrians and Lebanese fleeing religious persecution. Now, throughout that period of history and prior to independence, and even afterwards, the region remained important geostrategically. It has been the heart, at least in the past, of a number of military campaigns and expeditions from the Napoleonic Wars involving many European powers to American domination during the period of the Cold War, as you mentioned in your introduction. All that works together to actually form the geopolitical mindset of the Caribbean and of certain European and North American powers with respect to the Caribbean. 
But despite the region's importance, economic self-sufficiency has always been their Achilles heel. And even today, the islands remain economically open, attached to the metropolitan powers. And through trade, the education systems, the judicial systems, the language, the cultural mores, all of which are forms of soft and hard power being leveraged over them. Now, by the time the dust of independence movements had settled in the Caribbean, most of the English and Spanish speaking islands were self-governing. Haiti was a republic, and you have a few others like Montserrat, the BVI, Martinique, Guadeloupe, which remain European outposts in the region. Today, the region is still a maritime gateway to the southeastern United States. Its location offers commercial access to the Atlantic coast, and the Caribbean sits between multiple military and commercial logistics hubs. Now, you mentioned what impact history has on the Caribbean today. Well, the legacy of slavery and colonialism does have a marked impact on the Caribbean since. And let me just give one example. Let's take the Windrush issue, which um, has direct legacy in colonialism. Uh, a large group of Caribbean immigrants were brought to the UK to resolve labor shortages during the post-war period. These were offered permanent residence status. And discredit such as hostile immigration policies against these descendants of Caribbean origin increased. And so the issue of reparations has come, come to the fore in favor of those who built the foundation of many European and American economies that are thriving today. Another example is, let's say, from the health perspective. The Caribbean is suffering under the weight of non-communicable diseases developed from the poor nutritional lifestyles that were inherited from slavery and during colonial times. This fight moves towards nutritional diversification in recent years. So to conclude, colonial relations have shaped and are still shaping the economic, cultural, material, human exchanges that exist between the North Atlantic and Europe and the Caribbean today. And it's interesting to see how these continue to affect their relationship in the future. Thank you, Paula. Thank you so much. Now, Eustace, is there anything in particular that you might wish to share at this point before we move on? Yes, Ambassador, just one quick thing. And I think it's important. Paula talked about the systemic issues that remain because of colonialism and slavery and all of that. And I think as we think about coalitions and multilateral organizations, one thing that we found is a gross underrepresentation of small island states in these organizations. Now, one can name a few. Selwyn Hart at the UN is doing great work. Pamela Coke Hamilton at ITC is doing great work. And there are a few others. But I think one of the things that these institutions need to recognize is that if you're going to talk about climate change, if you're going to talk about sustainable development, you need to ensure that island states are at the table, and not just at the table in terms of membership, but at the table implementing policies, following up on these policies, and actually deciding on what policies are. And I think our inclusion in international organizations is important. Personnel is policy, and that is something that multilateral organizations and these groupings need to recognize going forward. I couldn't agree more, Eustace. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we've come to the stage where actually this is what's going to get our issues as small island developing states on the agenda in places and theaters where it matters. Now let's quickly move on to the geopolitical stage. The Caribbean, of course, as we've established, has featured prominently in a number of European wars. Islands like St. Lucia changed hands 14 times between the French and, and the British as all empires sought to defend and secure their interests. And even today, the face of Europe is very firmly articulated in the archipelago of, of, of Caribbean uh, small island states. Today, the Caribbean has many important relationships with the United States, with Europe, with China, as well as with other actors such as India, Russia, and more. Now, these relationships sometimes raise very important questions regarding the interest, whose interests are actually being served. Though small, however, the Caribbean generally has a reputation for standing firm with respect of its own values and beliefs. The region took a firm stance against apartheid in South Africa. 
Its scholars and activists were integral to the Pan-African movement to end colonialism. We have stood in solidarity with Cuba against an embargo which has hurt their citizens. And Cuba has been a model of South-South development cooperation, not only in the Caribbean, but around the world. Today, the Caribbean is providing shelter for Venezuelans in their time of need, not forgetting their many acts of kindness in previous times when times were good for them. These acts of solidarity have not been without cost for the Caribbean and at times have been quite thorny in discussions, not only at the UN, but in our bilateral relationships with the United States, with Europe and other actors, and certainly within uh, the halls of the OAS. Now let's take a deeper look at some of these relationships in turn, starting with the Caribbean-US relationship and starting with you, Eustace. There's a new Biden administration installed. What changes can we expect in the relationship between the Caribbean and the USA, already pronouncements and there's a sense that uh, we are on the agenda again in a very good and positive way. But what are your views? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I think because I'm in Ottawa, allow me to borrow a quote from Trudeau the Elder, who said, being next to the US is like sleeping with an elephant no matter how friendly or even tempered the beast, one is affected by every twitch and every grunt. And so, as you know, we are considered the third border of the United States, a, a phrase that was coined by George Bush and has been part of the lexicon ever since. The US has benefited from Countries like my own, St. Kitts and Nevis, where our founding father, Alexander Hamilton, was instrumental in that country's early successes, including at Treasury, including at the Coast Guard, and of course, across the, one of the most important states, New York. And so St. Kitts and Nevis, we're proud of that legacy that we've contributed to the United States of, of America. As you said, early indications from the administration are positive. Recently, our foreign ministers met with Secretary Blinken. They've had dialogue with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And these meetings were important because in the moment that we are, the access to vaccines will be a key measure as to whether or not these early commitments bear fruit. As President Biden said yesterday in Geneva, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so as we go forward, we'll be looking to see how true the change will be in terms of Caribbean outreach. Of course, the Build Back Better agenda that President Joe Biden has outlined very much dovetails closely with the resilience building program of the Caribbean region whether it's climate resilient infrastructure, whether it's sustainable agriculture, whether it's maritime and the blue economy, these things are very much congruent with what we are doing in the region to ensure that we can build back better after the pandemic and in the long term. And so the reinvestments that we are seeing through the American Rescue Plan, the American Jobs Plan, and the American Families Plan, these large scale reinvestments in the American economy is important for us. And I think yesterday, the Fed said that the US will be growing at a 7% GDP. And I think as we are so linked in with the American economy to tourism, to trade, to services, that growth and its spillover effects is important for us. And so that's something that we can't ignore. Of course, the America rejoined the Paris Agreement, which is a bread and butter issue for us. And so the rhetorical discourse that we're now seeing is, in, is an important shift. And we look forward to the commitments that will be made in Glasgow, particularly as it relates to climate finance. And we see some discussions coming out of the G7 about commitments from developed countries. Of course, 
We want to see more than pledges. We want to see the actual finance. And that is something that we've long struggled with. And so hopefully with this new thrust in the US administration, that will be a fruit. And another important point is the IFIs and the need for America to join us in adopting a vulnerability index. Because as we know, the pandemic and the recovery will require massive amounts of, of assistance to concessional lending and the current measures that are in place will leave us behind if we don't get a change in terms of doing away with GDP per capita and bringing in vulnerability index. And one point before I wrap up, of course, the Summit of the Americas should be happening later this year. And I think that presents a key opportunity for us to take our message directly to the American president so that we can be, we could be of one mind as we go forward. Thank you, Lucas, and you're quite right about the importance of the uh, Summit of the Americas. Um, I remember um, being part, party to the discussions with uh, the then new incoming uh, President Obama, uh, where we spoke to him about our issues. And number one on the agenda uh, for us at that time was the issue of Cuba and the historic uh, embargo and the significance of that to all of Latin America and the Caribbean at this point. Now, Escipio, uh, for us to move quickly along, um, of course, trade makes up a very important component of our relationship with the USA. In just a few minutes, can you shed some light as to what's important in that relationship uh, today with the United States in terms of goods and services? Thank you, Dr. Ishmael. Uh, the US is the main trading partner for all the Caribbean. Even main uh, for the Dominican Republic, uh, we don't know if it's hater of the US, but they are side by side. So what we do need help from the United States is that the United States helps the Caribbean integration by favoring as much as possible the creation of integrated value chains that we can use systems like you have of hope and help in Haiti, so that Haiti can also work with its neighbors to have truly Caribbean value chains that have a preferential access into the American market. We would also need assistance from the United States in giving our medium, small and micro, set, uh, micro enterprises the sufficient funds to operate a uh, in a competitive manner. What I'm talking about is not really handouts, it's helping us to put in place financial systems uh, or funding trade finance that help us, uh, that, that trade financing that could be audacious, that could favor the sustainable development of the funds rather than financial performance, that these funds be development oriented, that are willing to assume calculated risk with a view of fostering the economic development of our countries, that uh, financial systems that are innovative, that uh, work on the interest rate, on the repayment period, on the collateral. A lot of our service providers have a lot of problems in obtaining loans because they don't have the guarantee that goes with it. When you go to a bank in the United States with an idea, you might come out with a loan. If you go with an idea to one of the banks in our region, they will tell you, great idea, please let me see the deeds of the house of your mother and the land of your grandfather as collateral. And we also want that the United States help our countries uh, to be part of the discussion when we're talking about the uh, money laundering and counter terrorism financing ideas. I think that for the moment, this has been unilateral imposed on, us, imposed on us. And I do believe that in order to allow our private sector, which include also financial services, to have a, a fair share, that we need to be in the table discussing these issues. So um, thank you very much. I, I tried to be short. Thank you so very much. No, but uh, this whole idea, particularly with the financial services sector, uh, is one that we've been working on for a very long time with very, very, very little by way of actual improvement, I would say. But let's take a, a look at uh, 
the relationship uh, polar between uh, the Caribbean and the EU. Of course, uh, the EU is very important uh, to the Caribbean in terms of a very, very important development partner. But there again, the issue of um, financial flows and the um, uh, so-called tax havens uh, looms, looms large, as you will recall uh, some of our uh, very heated conversations uh, with some of our EU colleagues on the subject. But tell us a little bit more, uh, Paula, about the nature of the relationship. Uh, I will just very quickly uh, set the stage just by saying that, as everybody knows, uh, the Cotonou Partnership Agreement that guided the relationship between the Caribbean, the um, Africa and the Pacific group of countries over the last 20 years uh, came to an end uh, fairly recently. And in December last year, on the 3rd of December 2020, we heard of conclusion of the negotiations and a new partnership agreement that sets the terms, some of them quite different for the Caribbean and the Pacific with respect to the future 20 years. We know that the EU's focus within the grouping of the ACP is very much on Africa, and uh, we're not going to discuss that. There are reasons why we are more interested in the P and, and the C at this moment. So Paula, how important is the EU's relationship uh, um, in terms of development cooperation and everything else for the Caribbean? What are your views? Thank you. You, you Indeed, the, the EU has been our longest standing development cooperation partner for, for over 40 years. Um, and in its last financing cycle, it actually provided up to 29 billion euros to ACP countries. But when you look at the way the world is turning today, there are real geopolitical considerations that have taken the fore with respect to the EU's policy development. We cannot close our eyes to increasing Euroscepticism, rising populism in Europe, the impact of climate change and increased scarcity of natural resources, new challenges such as migration. All of these things, they cost more to the European economy. And so the European citizens ask questions. Why do we spend as much on development cooperation? And the EU needs to justify its actions, which it never really did, not in that manner before. Now the EU is seeking uh, coherence by simplifying its programs, its budget. And, and as a result, and for other politically motivated reasons, the Caribbean may feel a bit left aside or, or taken off the EU cooperation radar. That may not necessarily be the case, but there are new realities motivating new EU development cooperation. And that is why I would suggest that the Caribbean looks at cooperation in a different way with respect to the EU. Beyond traditional development cooperation, the EU is a global normative authority. It's an area where the EU wields tremendous power, soft power, because they diffuse their norms within all the international relations. They're also a global regulatory authority, which means that they, they develop laws that affect all international interactions with them, whether it be global trade, competition, taxation, human rights, the digital economy. And the Caribbean SIDS can benefit or they can be squeezed by certain norms if they're not considered to be in line with these. Now, one strategy the region can espouse is actually to appeal to those very norms and values that the EU is promoting, because states have the merit of being the, the conscience of the world, appealing to the morals that the EU holds dear, and according to which they should not make their partners worse off with their cooperation model. <laughs> it's up to the region to determine how to approach that. The Caribbean region still remains important to the EU, you said so, and it is true, not least because of the EU's presence in the region. Now, the EU is also interested in areas of prime importance to the Caribbean, like environment, my, my marine biodiversity, ocean governance, and so on. And the marine importance, the maritime importance of the region is still very important. We find these elements in the new EU Green Deal. But there are new forms of development cooperation with the EU that need to be deepened. And these must be based on the relationship situated within the context of a positive contributions for both partners. And this is alluded to in the new Caribbean protocol of the new OACP EU partnership agreement that Escipion mentioned. At the same time, it is important for the Caribbean Sea to see how 
the alliances that are made by their partners in the global arena can affect them. And we can talk about the redynamizing of US EU relations, what impact that can have on the Caribbean states. And sometimes EU, EU challenges, political challenges with other countries may also affect this. These are the new approaches I believe that we should take into account when we develop our development or just cooperation with the EU going forward. In fact, SIDS would do best to work agilely with normative powers, the EU, military powers, the US, global financial powers, but not getting scorched in the process if possible. Now, it's a truism <laughs> that EU policies can affect cooperation uh, with the Caribbean. For example, as you mentioned, blacklisting of the Caribbean state uh, affecting their, rep their reputation and economic prospects. But one anchor that the region has is the Article 349 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, which concerns the EU outermost regions, which recognize the vulnerabilities of those, re those islands, Martinique, Guadeloupe, related to their geography, size, and vulnerabilities. They require special attention. And so that is one, this is, an, these are a number of areas which I would propose to suggest that the Caribbean is really focus on as they consider cooperation going forward. Thank you, Paula. I'm going to ask all my colleagues to uh, uh, be very concise in the next minutes, which we have. We've got a half hour left. We've still got some ground to cover. Uh, Isipion, uh, most of the, a lot of the EU's relationship with the Caribbean is bound in development cooperation around the idea of trade. Uh, some 10 years ago, of course, we were signatories to the EPAS, the Economic Partnership Agreement, which I don't very much, well, I mean, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the DR, but I certainly know that for the English-speaking uh, Caribbean, the EPAS are yet to unlock the promise and the potential that we had all signed up to. But um, what steps have been taken to ensure that uh, the EPAS that were signed such a long time ago now will redound to the benefit of our region. And are there any other things that we should look at in the new relationship that will be make economically uh, the future a little bit more uh, concrete and, and better and more certain for the Caribbean islands? Thank you very much, uh, Len. Uh, that is a very interesting question. First, I, I, I would like to say that the European Union has helped a lot in the construction of the Caribbean as a group uh, since the colonial times, and, and that the relationship we have a special relationship. With regards to the IPA itself, I, I, well, I had the honor of participating in the review of the IPA as one of the speakers, and, and I do believe that the IPA was incorrectly sold to us. I think there was a huge misunderstanding when we were negotiating the IPA. Because the message that the European Union gave to us was, you will be better off tomorrow than today through the EPAS. That was not necessarily the truth. The truth was, look, you are a country's member of the WTO. The relationship that we had on the LOME 4 was not WTO compatible. And basically, this is the best deal you will get. And that was the truth. It's not a bad deal, but it's, it's not what we had before. Before we had uh, access to the European market with no restrictions. And even when there were some restrictions and then we have a, a fixed price that was a higher than the normal price. So I think that, that the, for the EPA to work, and that was something that maybe we never understood, that the regional integration process had to be profound. We really have to work to have a regional market that will cater for investment that will come to serve that market because we had that special relationship. So I, I think that it, it was on both sides. Unfortunately, the region has not, for many reasons, that maybe it would take like two weeks to discuss, has not gone towards a regional market. Uh, there have been issues integrating uh, the regional market. I do see that uh, CARICOM has now relaunched the CSME. At the time that I was working in the region, the Caribbean single market and economy was only implemented around 60%. So I do believe that if the CSME is launched, then I think that maybe the EPA will help more. In specific things that we can ask the European Union, 
I would something that we're trying to have is the, enable the accumulation of rules of origin between the only LDC in the region, which is Haiti, that trades under anything but arms ever, which they, they does not allow automatic accumulation, which is with the uh, countries under the economic partnership agreement. I do believe that we do have to have a, a enhanced uh, customs cooperation. And I do believe that definitely there has to be a discussion, like Paula was talking, on the new rules and regulations that the Commission is putting in place, especially with regards to the uh, farm to fork and biodiversity strategies, which are part of the Green Deal. Uh, more and more rules are getting tougher, and I do believe that our countries need to sit down on the table and discuss part of those rules of market access. Last is also Brexit. Brexit has impacted us a lot because they, uh, in the agreement between the European Union and, and the UK, they didn't allow accumulation for third parties and were considered a third party. So now countries that had, uh, and like we all had, established direct routes for the European Union and not uh, by passing either by continental Europe or London, not different routes, we are exposed to the fact that maybe if you use London as your first port of entry, part of your merchandise, the one that was destined to the continental Europe, will be considered non-originary and will pay humongous amounts of taxes. So this is the things that we're looking at, but a lot of that passes, like I say, by customs cooperation. Uh, again, I try to be brief. Yes, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, much appreciated, but lots of information to cover. Um, Eustace, just in a couple of words, uh, uh, the blue economy, the digital economy have been thrown up as very concrete um, platforms for EU Caribbean engagement. In a few words, can you tell us why those two? Well, I think the why is not as important as the when. And I said that because I think the European Green Deal presents an enormous opportunity and something that didn't come up was the fact that the European countries in the Caribbean represent exclusive economic zones of the EU. And this is just alongside our own economic zones. So I think partnerships in that area is important. The EU is passing or just passed rather $1.8 trillion broken down between the multi-annual financial framework and the EU recovery plan. I think within that, there are calls to internationalize the European Green Deal. And I think we can benefit from that by working with our neighbors, Martinique, Guadeloupe, St. Martin, St. Bart, the Dutch islands, to actually do a lot of work, including coastal restoration, coral reef restoration, very, foundational things that help us in terms of seizing on the opportunities embedded within the blue economy and the drive towards ensuring that our maritime sector can be much more foundational to all of our development efforts. And I know that we're out of time. There's lots more to say on that, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, that was short and sweet and to the point. Thank you, Eustace. We want to move on very quickly now to a very important relationship with many partners around the world, and that is the relationship of the Caribbean with China. Um, China, of course, we know is the number one or two trading partner for most countries in the world. Um, it is very important in terms of relations with many of the countries of the Caribbean and Latin America. Tensions between China and the United States, of course, we've said are at an all time high many of the countries though that we will consider to be the global south and those who were part of the non-aligned movement however are of the view that they should not be asked to pick a side and should not be squeezed between east and west now how does the caribbean navigate geopolitical turbulence and avoid being squeezed in this process when the united states is an important partner but so is china now paula why, what is your take on this uh, with respect of the importance of China uh, to the development of the Caribbean? Thank you. It's a heavy question. <laughs> Absolutely, and we don't have enough time to do no, we don't have enough time here. Just in a, few, in, in, in a few seconds, yeah. as you mentioned, China 
is rising, has risen, and that has transformed the global economy. And therefore, one can surmise that good relations with China are fundamental to the economic prospects of the countries, of countries, uh, including Caribbean cities. And as you rightly said, it's more than just finance in itself. It's a major development cooperation partner for a number of developing countries. Now, China's interest in the Caribbean keeps growing. And that increases its strategic value to China. In commercial terms, the Caribbean is a diverse middle-income market for Chinese goods. It's a financial center for receiving outward-bound Chinese foreign investment, like any other uh, country. And it's also a source of modest, modest amounts of certain natural ores. In terms of trade, um, China actually holds a trade surplus, which is not very difficult over the region. Uh, it exports over $6 billion of goods to the region, region importing only about $1.9 billion, and that was 2019. So China is undoubtedly an important economic global player, and increasingly so to the region. For example, its Belt and Road Initiative has become the world's largest platform for international cooperation. And as of January 2021, 10 Caribbean countries have signed onto the Belt and Road Initiative with in agreements in place uh, to deepen trade ties, building bridges, airports, improving energy, telecommunications networks, etc. So with the Chinese being possibly the only major economy to have shown growth since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, albeit uh, mere two percent, but China is actually, or probably maybe, well positioned to contribute to the econ economic recovery of many countries in the world, and specifically the Caribbean cities. So, to, say, to, 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 to wrap it up, while global political strategies are about pursuing countries' interests, it does. This requires countries to work pragmatically with other states when the interests coincide. And I say that with respect to Caribbean countries. It is important, however, to maintain common values and morals if there is to be a common understanding among states and people for sustainable development. That is my take on how the region approaches and should be approaching their geopolitical relations in the very tight uh, environment that you mentioned earlier on. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting to note that um, Germany has recently issued a statement that it is the growth of China, even in these desperate times, that has provided a very lucrative market for all of their high-end goods, including luxury cars and everything else. So it's not just the Caribbean. Uh, uh, after 2008, 2009, I mean, don't forget that uh, China was the engine that refueled economic growth around the world. So, okay, let's move on now. Escipion, I ask you the same question. You might have a slightly different view from Paula, of course, but nonetheless, complementary view. What is your view of the role of China with respect to the Caribbean's development? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishmael. The, the first thing is, is to say that China is not a newcomer in the Caribbean. Huh? China has been there for the longest time. In my country, we have cooperation with China uh, since early 1900s. In fact, China helped Dominican Republic develop our rice industry. Today, Dominican Republic is a major producer because we, we collaborated with China that sent people to show us how to have better practices, agricultural practices. So, and we have, I suppose in all, or if not in most of our countries, big Chinese communities. So it's very important to acknowledge that China has always been part of us as well. I, I like proverbs. And one proverb that I like, particularly like is an African proverb that says, uh, similar to the elephant one that I think Eustace mentioned was that, or, or Paula, is that when elephant fights, the grass suffers. We do not want to be the grass in this. The United, Nation, the United States is our main partner and has always been. It helped us a lot in, in our independence wars and, and a lot. So we will always be indebted to them. But it, it, working with China is not against anybody. It's in favor of everybody. Uh, China is a big investor in the United States, in Europe, and hopefully in the Caribbean as well. We do need that uh, work. And I like something that Paula says. 
it is true that we have a, a very big commercial deficit with China, but it also causes a problem. Why? Because the containers are going back empty to China. We should work towards, we have almost a free ride for our goods. If we get our act together, promote the sharing of containers, uh, the cooperative work, and maybe e even, again, I love working about accumulation and, and working with, with, together as a group, which is what we need to go to do go forward, is that we could take advantage of the very reduced cost of exporting our products to China, because at the end of the day, the containers have to go back to China to come back to us by filling them and working together. I would say also that a strategy for China cannot be trying to compete on price or quantity. You mentioned, Dr. Ishmael, China buys luxury products. We produce luxury products. We have to package them in a way that they appeal to the Chinese consumer. We have the best rum in the world. We have the best coffee, the best cocoa. Let's sell this, but even if it is true that maybe selling chocolate to China is not a good strategy because they are not big chocolate consumers. But that is also things that you have to analyze when you look at this. So I do believe that we have to do our market research and the Caribbean should not try to export to China because that's too big for us. We have to choose a city, a sector, a province or something that is to our size in which we can at least for the first, uh, at the beginning, service very high value added products, quality products, and hopefully even with a regional quality seal, that is something that we have tried to work in, in the past. So in the Caribbean, for China, Caribbean must equal to quality and exotism. Scipion, thank you for that. Um, you've elaborated on a question I'm going to ask all of you uh, in a few minutes what is it that we're not doing well enough, what we need, what is it that we need to be doing better? And it's that sort of thing, vision and thinking into the future, which we are not, uh, have not been particularly agile at scouring the horizon for opportunities that might be developed and readying ourselves to take advantage of those. Now, Eustace, I've, I, I, I pose this question to you because Yours is one of the few countries in the world that has diplomatic um, relations, not with not with uh, Beijing, but with Taipei. And so the one China policy, in fact, is a little bit of uh, a difficulty in that scenario. But uh, all countries are sovereign states and they determine uh, the use of their diplomatic relationships, as St. Kitts and Nevis has done. Um, Whilst you don't can't share an experience with respect of the relationship with China, but tell us a little bit in just few few minutes uh, the 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 nature of the cooperation between Bastyr and and um, and Taipei. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And as you mentioned, Saint Kitts Nevis since its independence has enjoyed a great relationship with Taiwan. And you know, we're discussing small island states. Taiwan, in many respects, shares a lot of the same characteristics. They're an island state, they're coastal, and they're very much about flora and fauna. And I think that where we can, we develop a strong strategic cooperation around healthcare, around capacity building, around agriculture. And these things are foundational to our own development. You know, my minister loves to say, Stinkin Senevis is a friend of all and enemy of none. And that is how we approach our relationship in that sphere. I think that as we talk about how SIDS can navigate this new complicated world, I think one thing that we all agree on and that is how to make the international system much more inclusive. And I think that this current period with COVID, Taiwan has shown that it has certain expertise. At the beginning, it, is one of, it was one of those countries who did brilliantly at containing COVID. And there are lessons that we can take from Taiwan's own management of, 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 the, of the pandemic. And I think that is something in Sinkis and Nevis that we've been able to benefit from. They have helped us enormously 
to you know deal with this very critical issue and as i said throughout the international system we need to be looking at all countries all peoples to see how we can incorporate best practices into ensuring that we come out on the other side of whatever problems we have so i leave it at that okay well put Thank you, Eustace. Now, just very quickly, in just a couple of minutes uh, that we have left, just to finish on this particular segment, before we go into a discussion about what does the future look like for, for Caribbean cities. There are other actors, of course, many others engage in, in, in the Caribbean, and I think of Russia, the Middle East, Morocco, India, and others. My question to, to the three of you, just in, in, in one minute or so from each of you, what are your views about these new actors? What opportunities do they bring? Are these opportunities for the region or are these opportunities more for them? What is it that we're looking to them for? And Eustace, I want to start with you. Um, specifically, when you take a look at the Middle East, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, and all of the others, um, what are the opportunities that they represent for the Caribbean? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. As you were asking the question, I was just having a flashback to my childhood, you know, two years ago. And, <laughs> and I remember Kuwait being very much involved in a lot of the infrastructure work that was being done, building our deep water port, that sort of stuff. So I would say that these countries of the Middle East, they've been in the Caribbean for some time, like many of the other countries around the world. Some of them left. And I think they're now coming back because they realize that the global discourse around green and blue economy lends itself to partnerships when it comes to whether it's clean energy, whether it comes to resilient infrastructure. And we are seeing that happen much more frequently. Our sister country of Dominica just signed an agreement with the UAE to develop a 50 million program geared towards clean energy. Of course, we have IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, which is headquartered in Abu Dhabi, looking very much to leverage that soft power to work with small island states. And I think those sort of partnerships are ones that we should welcome. Um, Qatar has long been a partner of many of our countries as well. So I think collectively, what we can do is ensure that we set the terms of the partnership to reflect our reality. And that is we need to build resilience, resilience across foundational um, aspects of our development agenda. And that is infrastructure, energy, agriculture. And I think they represent great partners because they themselves are looking to, to diversify their own energy needs. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Et Cipion, um, I know that you have a, 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 maybe a special fondness, is it, for Morocco? So do I, actually. Um, um, why don't you tell me why you view Morocco's um, interest in the Caribbean. They've started to uh, open a number of embassies uh, across the Caribbean as well. Uh, we have a joint um, uh, Eastern Caribbean States mission in Rabat as well. Uh, so things are moving. Uh, what are your views? Sir? Thank you, Dr. Ishmael. Yes, uh, I have a special fondness for Morocco because we established a cooperation in customs with Morocco between Dominican Republic, Haiti and Morocco. Morocco is a country that is also very internationalized, but it's similar to us. It's a country that is in the middle of the Mediterranean, so it has really uh, been conquered or passed by so many armies and people and have a blended culture similar to ours, and they're willing to collaborate. But I would also like to say that the relationship of the Caribbean with the Middle East is also very long. I would not also say Morocco, I, I would also say Lebanon, Syria, and others. The president of the Dominican Republic today his father comes from a small village in Lebanon, uh, Mr. Abinader, and that was publicized in Lebanon when he won the election. So the relation, the Caribbean has benefited our culture, our food, uh, our customs have been influenced by the Middle East a lot, and Morocco, Syria, Lebanon, Palestinian, 
Israel also has a very big influence in our country. It's a very important one. For my own Dominican Republic, they also brought a lot of technology. So we are friends of all, like Eustat says, an enemy of none. So I really like of collaborating with everybody and playing that card of being from anywhere. I especially like Morocco, among others, because a lot of people think I'm Moroccan in Belgium. <laughs> they speak to me, uh, so I like it. I like it. And the Morocco national team of football is a very good as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paula, India. Uh, India, of course, is increasingly uh, um, uh, a global actor. Uh, India is refashioning its own, uh, not only its sense of self, but its own sense of place in the world. Um, many of our people from across the Caribbean also have direct link, ancestral links to India from previous periods of our history. And India, of course, is a very important part of the BRICS, together with Russia, together with South Africa, etc. In just a, a minute or so, what do you see as the role of India in its new sense of self and place in the world uh, with respect to the Caribbean, that yeah. relationship? Thank you. You are right. India is already in the Caribbean. Um, 30 to 40 percent of the population of the Southern Caribbean is made up of people of Indian heritage. So you're very, very right there. You, India, therefore, is a, a very relevant ally for small Caribbean islands. Also, we have similar stories to tell. Um, as Scipion was saying, uh, common sports passions, part of the Commonwealth, our cuisine is influenced by India, cultural artifacts, lifestyle. So what we would call French uh, partnerships, some India would call friendship uh, with respect to its development cooperation or support to the Caribbean, for example, a vaccine friendship plan under which it gave a number of doses, thousands of doses to Caribbean islands uh, who had been left behind by this humanitarian crisis. Um, India also contributes to the Caribbean Development Fund. Um, I, I wasn't even aware of that, but I was told recently that India has actually supported the development of a regional center for excellence in information technology in Guyana. So India is very active. So the, the, our region has become a gateway for Indian soft power in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, there is potential for increased, com increased commerce and trade with India. Tourism also, because India has been acquiring investments in the region to promote uh, tourism, Ayurvedic and wellness centers. So the pandemic has only emphasized the importance of deepening relations with India as a partner. And this is just the beginning. Um, we mentioned India, but there's also Brazil um, and, and Silac. But Brazil is, is special because for a long time, the Caribbean was not part of South American countries' hierarchy of concern. Um, but the development of um, developing country status, globalization, all of that stimulated the interest of Brazil uh, in the region. And it became a serious influencer of the Caribbean region, especially, especially under President Lula, uh, during which Brazil sought greater collaborative links with CARICOM. So, I mean, this has to be said. Now, with respect to wider select relations, the relations with CARICOM became troubled because of the EU banana sugar regimes. Everybody's aware of that. Um, and Brazil realizing that offered resources to help diversify sugar production in the Caribbean. And currently there is a huge trade imbalance in favor of Brazil, but trade still happens and it still offers great potential for increased diversification of trade. So um, what are the implications for relations in the hemisphere with CELAC and with, with Brazil? The Caribbean is right in the middle of this hemisphere. And whether the larger players demonstrate regard for our geopolitical, geopolitical concerns or not, I believe it still behoves the region to stimulate those relations that have been embryonic for a number of decades. And the region can draw out the potential in new areas of partnership. We mentioned those for the EU, for China, but with respect to Latin America, it's technology, digital connectivity, creativity, culture, education, health. And there's so much more that can be done. South Africa, their presence is so small, it's in the region, and they are still seeking to expand. A number of Caribbean countries like Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, have embassies in South Africa. So what we're looking at today is potential. We mentioned the BRICS, 
I can only say potential. Okay, thank you, Paula. And we'll come 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 to this issue about um, the future right now, actually. So this is a perfect segue into this because we've had a very, very rich discussion about the reality of the Caribbean and the current status quo. A new world order, however, we agree is evolving from one which was unipolar to another which is increasingly bipolar with two superpowers and a clutch of regional powers, many of whom are from the global south. Where do Caribbean cities see themselves? And I would like to pose a series of questions to each of you. And our producers have said that we, we can take a few more minutes beyond our time, uh, which would normally have expired in two minutes. Paula and Eustace, I will ask each of you to share with us your views. Two minutes each, please, no more. Should the Caribbean strategy as SIDS be recalibrated to reflect shifts in global power? Is a new external vision required? A new initiatives aimed at outreach? And Paula, you've just been speaking about some of those. Eustace, start with you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. You know, both you and Isixio recently talked about Morocco as representing an interesting country. I remember years ago when the Atlantic Dialogues kicked off, one of the aims of that um, conference was to shift mental maps. That is, think about the world in a different way. And Morocco has been very strategic in that regard. And I would posit that the Caribbean, the sins of the Caribbean, need to take a similar approach. And the Atlantic space comes to mind as one of the immediate areas for recalibration. We tend to see the discourse around the transatlantic space to the United States, Canada, and Europe. Centuries ago, when we talked about the transatlantic, the Caribbean was at the center of the transatlantic space albeit in a very depressing and dehumanizing way. But I think now we've grown enough to force ourselves to the center of the conversation, taking advantage of our historical story, but more than that, our historical linkages. And one of the areas we've not delved into throughout this discussion, and colleagues would have passed over it, and that is Africa. West Africa, North Africa, South Africa, East Africa, the African continent. So while we talk about the US and China, the EU, I think Africa, because of its demographics, represents an area that for us is natural. Our brothers and sisters are African. I had a chance when I was in Senegal to go to Ile Doré. And the emotion that you feel when you visit that place tells you everything that you need to know about where the Caribbean can go in recalibrating a lot of its relationship in this new world. Yes, we navigate the power politics that's happening in our neighborhood and elsewhere, but history offers us a guide as to where to go. And I know that we're short for time, so I'll let Paula continue if she wants to add to that train of thought. Thank you, uh, Eustace. Um, it takes me back to a piece which I, I wrote and published just about a year and a half ago, entitled, you and Paula would both know it, Underinvested, the Caribbean-African Relationship. Of course, it was there and it was strong before. Now it's ad hoc, and it needs to be much more systemic and great and, and certain. And perhaps uh, the new leadership at CARICOM will take hold of that and, and, and maybe we, we, we see some benefits from that past history, which is so rich. Paula, what would you add to this? Yes, in fact, I would just build on what Eustace is saying, but looking at the region itself and how it operates. You see, to recalibrate the region's strategy, that implies that there is a common foreign strategy. And I make a little pause here. You see, the, need, the region would need to muster the political will to overcome its implementation deficit and become resourceful and creative and innovative in its approach to harvest all these new opportunities that are just shining at it, which you mentioned. Probably one option would be to allow for the existence of variable ge geometry 
in decision making in the region. This is something that we've not been very strong at, but it's probably worth consider consideration. And focus on enhancing our comparative and competitive advantage to boost our access to global opportunities. Create consequential diplomatic outreach. Otherwise, we will not be able to reach into and to be present in all these places that you just mentioned. And I would just end with this. We need to enhance our geopolitical agility through observation of the changes in global trends and respond with alacrity to these because the change will not come to us. It will be forced upon us. Now, of course, this requires specialized skills, which the region does not lack. It just needs to recalibrate and to redeploy. Thanks. It's the mindset, Paula, you're absolutely right. Uh, there was a period at which the OECS did this quite well. Scouring the horizon for opportunities engaged fundamentally in building development partnerships around the world. And we, we did this quite well. Um, we're talking about political will. Scipion, is there political will with respect of the Caribbean rethinking investment strategies? Is there a need for a comprehensive investment strategy? Can this be done? Yeah, yeah, no, it's happening. It, it, in fact, we have a comprehensive investment strategy that was developed by CARICOM and CARIFORUM, uh, by Caribbean expert, really, and I was personally a big part of that. And it's being implemented. It's being implemented by uh, nowadays, I believe it's 21 countries and territories. It's being implemented not only by CARICOM, Dominican Republic alone, which is CARIFORUM, but also by the OCTs, Curaçao, Aruba, uh, Turks and Caicos, Cayman Islands, Montserrat, they're all working together in having a comprehensive investment strategy that sets the bar at a level because the, the idea that we start competing with each other, offering more and more advantages that will be in the detriment of your neighbor, of yourself in the long term is really bad. So that was the basis. It helps promote the region as a group and it created the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, CAIPA, which is nowadays presided by my friend, Diane Edwards, which is the head of JAMPRO. So th that is happening. I wanted, and you asked us a question at the beginning, uh, what do we need to change? And the first thing that we need to change for me is to believe in ourselves. Often we don't believe in ourselves. We believe that our products and our services are not as good as the ones that are imported. And we also have to think long-term we have to stop thinking that an election period is the only span that we're looking at. China thinks very long-term and the United States as well. We have to have long-term development policies. And, and I wanted to say and, and that Euta, Eustas is absolutely right. Africa is the frontier that we have to look for. There are brothers and sisters. When I, when I am in West Africa, especially West Africa, I feel at home. Uh, they wear different clothing, but they talk like us, they eat like us. Uh, they, it, it is something very similar. And uh, sometimes I get blasted because I tell in Africa that I feel African and then people look at me and laugh. But I do feel that my culture, my heritage, my music is African. And we do have to forge that common future within the OECPS, with the Pacific and with Africa not only West Africa, but also Central and East Africa. I, because of migration, most of our people came from West Africa and Angola. But we also have commonalities with other regions in Africa. Okay, then, now, do these times demand a new impulse for regionalization and deeper integration? I ask you this because uh, in 2007, 2008, in my days as Director General of the OECS, during the period of the international financial collapse, we seized that moment to reduce our vulnerabilities by deepening our integration through the formation of an economic union and building new regional institutions, turning a period of turbulence into an opportunity for the Eastern Caribbean to do things better. My view has always been that in times of turbulence, small states need each other more, not less. What are your views about what is required today? And Paula, I'm going to ask you this a minute or two of your time. Thank you. You, you, you are certainly, certainly on, on the spot here. The um, Caribbean states, they have understood that acting on their own individually, they cannot adequately address 
these global challenges that we're speaking about, whether it be pandemics or just the issue of indebtedness. Um, and the Barbados Prime Minister, Mia Motley, recently, I was listening to her when she addressed um, CARICOM quoted, and she said that because of the impending gravity of the crises that are looming for the Caribbean economies, that it is necessary for increased cooperation and deepened regional integration. And that's the only way to really kickstart recovery. And you are right. I mean, you were there at the center of it in 2008 during that financial crisis. The OECS applied that regional integration remedy. And today they're continuing with it. Removal of barriers to interregional trade, free movement of persons and skills, even harmonization of domestic regulation, for example, in the services sector. It's very rich in terms how, of how the OECS engages with its partners in this time of crisis. For example, with the EU as an international partner, with uh, specific international organizations like the World Bank, we also approach different developing country organizations like the African Union, for example. They had a, a first um, virtual meeting with the African Union in April, if I recall well, of this year to discuss how how to address the disparities and inequalities they face in obtaining vaccines for their population. At the wider CARICOM level, integration is a bit slower, let's say, um, and it reveals the need for deeper integration, but it tests CARICOM's sovereignty limits. But the current tide of change requires efficiency, adaptation, modernization, and the strengthening of the single market and economy of the Caribbean is sine qua non to building resilience as the OECS has done. And so the OECS, I believe, has shown the way and the entire, the wider Caribbean region can actually follow in the context of these global uh, crises that will follow. They have been doing much. For example, when Hurricane Maria hit or La Sufria volcano erupted, the Caribbean came together as one region using the regional organizations to support the, re the, the, the uh, islands that were affected and to react rapidly to assist in this time of need. So the possibility is there. I think we just need to be able to jump into it very quickly, uh, discover the underlying creativity and be effective in these times. And, and just to quickly, uh, you know, acknowledge with thanks and gratitude the assistance of Martinique as well, and Guadeloupe and the others uh, non-English speaking uh, SIDS uh, in our midst who also came to the aid of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in their time of very, very recent need. Now, uh, in five minutes and we're done. Um, I want your final thoughts and last message, and I will ask each of you uh, a minute and a half each, or one minute. What does the future call for? A rebranding of the Caribbean, the Caribbean as a safe zone, a tranquil zone, a healthy zone, a model for sustainable uh, living. I mean, in small size, there is an opportunity. Uh, there's nothing that we can't do if we focus on doing it together. And small need not define us as a challenge. It certainly is an opportunity. What are your final thoughts and the last message that you will leave in a minute and a half, Escipion, you first. And my friend, forgive me, but I have called you and pronounced you your name in every way imaginable. And for this, you just need to love me more. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ishmael. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It has been a wonderful experience to be able to share. I think that, that the future for the Caribbean has to pass by competitiveness. Uh, the era of handouts is over. We have to be competitive and we have to service the world with what we know quality, innovation, creativity. A lot of people say that we in the developing world have no innovation and that we just take it from others. But these people have not survived like we have survived. Uh, we have innovated even to be able to study uh, with no electricity, even to survive a hurricane and spend, I don't know, weeks or months without electricity and solidarity. What really defines us is our solidarity. And even if we do not 
always recognizes we are one people with different colors and different customs, but there's one identity. Every time I go to the Caribbean, I feel at home. We play dominoes, we eat chicken, we drink beer, and we love the beach. And I do believe there is much more commonalities that we have that differentiate us. So please believe in ourselves. Let's go together, one love. Wonderful, you, you, you end with uh, Bob Marley. Uh, Paula, you, your last message. My last message, in fact, what I would like to see happening in the region is that we create a unique development narrative with every single thing that we have. So whether it be education, tourism, whether it be agriculture, we're making everything green. Caribbean as a new brand that is integral to our sustainable development strategies in every single aspect of society. But once we've done that in the region, what I would love to see happening in the region is how we stand up and face the international uh, theater. So we see what's happening before our eyes. We reorganize ourselves, creating them thematic coalitions. We reimagine our geopolitical and economic relations, and we build true partnerships that respond to that narrative, that development narrative that we want to promote. Now, vulnerabilities do not change. They will not change. So we need to defend, and as you said at the beginning, be present at the table to be able to support our dialogue, frame our discussions, and identify sources of leverage in this current environment. One more thing, the power of public opinion. This is what actually gets the message across in this technological era that we're in through social media and similar platforms, creating a generation of alliances around issues of prime concern to us using communication tools and means that are, are at our disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Now, uh, Eustace, I've saved you for last. Um, for one good reason, you were in this group in our youth. Um, you are the face of the future uh, of the Caribbean. Uh, the last word is yours, after which I will wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for recognizing my youth. <laughs> 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 um, at the start of this segment, you asked a very important question what is the future or what should we look for in the future and my thing is we need to be aware of the future i think a lot of the times just the awareness that we're already in the future gets lost in us in the caribbean and this comes into sharp focus when we talk about the digital sphere i mean just this week the eu and the us agreed to set up a tech and trade policy council that will be setting the rules of the world for tech policy. Now, the Caribbean is one of those regions that we depend on connectivity. And so we need to begin the conversations about AI, about biometrics, even as it relates to travel, because our tourism sector will depend on that. So we need to start thinking about the future yesterday. And that's, I think, is very, very important. Another key element is we need to realize our leadership and own it because a lot of the discourse that's happening now about the green economy and the blue economy, the small island developing states started those dialogues way back in the 1990s, way back during the Barbados plan of action, way back in Rio. Those discourses are our dis discourses and we need to own it rather than let it be co-opted by the great powers and i think there's power in that if we can do that thank you uh eustace well said the one last piece of that i would add to all of which has been said before in terms of what we need to be doing better in the caribbean uh would be to value time as a currency that just doesn't ever come back and we act very much in our region as if if we don't get things done today then there's always tomorrow but it, in this age, there is tomorrow, there is, tomorrow is no longer given. And we need to value time and seize the moment when they come all along our way and to create the moments. Eustace. I just had one final point. I think as we are talking now through the Policy Center for the New South, a think tank, 
I think for a lot of the times we talk to each other and being able to diversify our audience is going to be key going forward. We just can't talk to governments and to each other. We have to talk to unconventional um, audiences. And that is directly to people, that is through think tanks, that is through universities, that is through youth councils and that sort of stuff. So I think it's important that we diversify, you know, people who we talk to. Absolutely, and we need to walk the talk. On that note, I want to thank Eustace Paula Escipion on behalf of the Policy Center for the New South and the Brussels Diplomatic Academy. I want to thank you so very much for spending time with us today. I want to give a special shout out to uh, my colleague Delia at the Brussels Diplomatic Academy and to Mohammed and his crew, Nazreen, and all of them at the Policy Center for supporting us so marvelously today and for giving us these extra 50 minutes. And to all of you, thank you. I hope you have learned a little bit more about the challenges of the Caribbean. And to my friends, love you always. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Abrazo.